Everybody says, don't have fear. But who actually tells you how not to have fear? What are you supposed to actually do when fear comes and it's crippling, it's paralyzing you, it's keeping you up at night and keeping you trapped and locked out of the life that you want for yourself? Today, I've got two letters to share with you. One from a mother who is terrified her kids are going to be damaged by her ex-husband. You'll find out why. And another letter, the first one that I'm going to read, from someone who can't control a tendency to completely fall apart at crucial moments. And hey, if you haven't clicked the subscribe button yet, I hope you will. It really helps me in the channel, and I'd love to have you in this community. So let's get started. Hello. First, I wanted to express my deepest gratitude for your work. Thank you, Cindy. I just discovered it, but I already feel so empowered and so many changes starting with using the daily practice and so many light bulb moments watching your videos. Thank you. Thank you for saying that, Cindy, and for mentioning the daily practice. Everybody here knows I talk about it all the time. These are the two techniques that I use and teach to help calm the symptoms of CPTSD. And you can learn it too. There's always a link in the description section below. Look for free course, free techniques, daily practice. Okay. Cindy says, my question is, how can I stop becoming dysregulated in the middle of high stakes meetings? Oh, I'm a PhD student, almost finished. I have a couple more meetings left with the committee and then the final defense. I'm terrified because in the last meetings I became triggered and one professor was so intense. My supervisor mentioned hazing and bullying and said she'd never have this professor on another committee. So that sounds bad and intense dysregulation followed. Now dysregulation, if you're new to my channel, dysregulation is a neurological thing that is really common for people who had trauma as kids, for adults who, who were abused or neglected as kids. And you might experience as being discombobulated, you might feel numb, you might feel a panic attack coming on, you could be very, very emotional, but it's, it's not you, it's a brain thing. It's a, it, your brain can be injured by neglect and abuse when you're little, and it causes your brain waves, sometimes under stress, to go all over the place, which is what it feels like, actually. And it can be measured on an MRI, so that's what dysregulation is. Dysregulation can also refer to emotional dysregulation, which often goes hand in hand, um, where emotions are too strong, too high, or super flat. You know, they're just kind of going out of proportion to the situation. And that's what Cindy is describing here is feeling so scared and hurt by somebody hazing her and bullying her. We'd all feel scared and hurt, but how much, right? Is, how, how bad is it? So Cindy says, this is not a problem of my work being poor. All professors characterize it as excellent and much better than most. I was holding back tears. My head was swimming. I couldn't answer these questions. I couldn't make sense of what they were saying, and as soon as the camera turned off, it was a Zoom meeting, I collapsed into a sobbing heap and stayed dysregulated for days. Oh, I so understand, Cindy. This also happened in face-to-face -face meetings before the pandemic. I can't have that happen again, especially not in the final defense. Do you have any suggestions of what I can do in general before the meetings, but especially what to do if I feel dysregulation start in the middle of the meeting? Thank you, Cindy. Oh, gosh. My heart just flies out to you. Um, I went to grad school, and so it wasn't like a PhD defense, but it was brutal. And I had that reaction quite often to certain situations. I don't think academia would have been a good environment for me. I do much better uh, working for myself, having clients, being self-employed, and I think that's common for people with CPTSD. So I often found job situations brutal, but academia, in my experience in grad school, it was the least touchy-feely place I ever was. It was it was pretty tough and it was kind of cutthroat, and uh, yeah, I didn't like that. I learned a lot. I'm grateful I got educated at least. Your description of dysregulation and emotional overwhelm is so spot on. You're holding back tears, your head is swimming, you can't answer questions. Have you ever had that where words are just going in and it's just like, uh, like it's just going by too fast and you're trying to say something and you get interrupted and sometimes getting interrupted when I'm talking and I'm already dysregulated, it can, it does, it just like causes me to crash. 
I can't think at all. There's, I, I collapse. Crash and collapse are two words I use for what happens when things get to be just too much. So I couldn't make sense what they were saying. And then as soon as the camera was off, so in this case, yay, camera's off, you cried and you had privacy to cry. And you're saying when the pandemic's over, it's going to be like face-to-face -face meetings and they're going to see you cry. And then they're going to think you don't deserve to get your PhD and that teaching might be a problem for you. How do you get free of fear is our topic today. It's awesome that you do the daily practice. That is going to give you so much strength. Now, I don't know how much you do it, but if you're like just about everybody, you're only kind of doing it right now. If you really are serious about wanting to get free of your fear, do it exactly as I taught, twice a day, and write a lot, like, like write a lot <laughs> when you sit down and write, unless you're in a super hurry, which would be like, you know, write, you wanna know what a super hurry, fill up this page, all right, with handwriting. That would be like, oh, you're in a terrible hurry. But do a full, like this size paper, one full one as a bare minimum normally, and do 10 when you're very upset. And when you're heading into a big thing, like you're, you're about to go defend your thesis, <sighs> there's going to be so much fear and everything. It's good. See, if you do the daily practice twice a day, oh, and by the way, you write twice a day and then you meditate. And if you really want to meditate, go learn Vedic meditation. It's really strong for calming this down. And the reason I say that it's a good one to do, if you have a meditation practice and you like it, do that if you're just totally grooved into it. If you don't yet meditate, I'm recommending Vedic because it's super easy. It's easy, but it's potent. But it doesn't require that you believe anything. It doesn't make you have to do any verbs at all. When you meditate, you get to like rest. You don't lay down, you sit up and you, you know, but you don't have to like sit up straight. I could never sit up straight. I would never meditate if I had to focus on my breath or sit up straight because I'm lazy. Because, because I'm really dysregulated in the morning. And so if it's not easy and comfortable and something I can do with a blankie and a cup of tea, you know, it's just, I'm not going to do it. So, <laughs> so that's my suggestion to you. Go for it with the daily practice. The third thing you need to really get serious with it is get a buddy. Now, if you're a member of Krabby Childhood Fairy, we are, we now, we have a registry that you can join and you can, you know, put your information there and say, I'm looking for a buddy. A buddy is somebody you read your fears and resentments to who also writes fears and resentments so that they understand the spirit of reading to each other is not to go, yeah, I'm resentful at, uh, at my professor. And they go, I'm resentful at that professor too. I hate them. We're not reading to get agreement on our fears and resentments. We're reading to have a witness as we just like admit it and seek to be free of them. And the best thing about having a buddy is that you find out how much you're not alone. And the best part of all, you end up having a laugh. The fears and resentments we have when you read them to another person who gets it, who's had them too, they do, they become funny. And that's like the best outcome at all. It's funny that we do that. It's also tragic. Sometimes our fear and fears and resentments are about tragic things. And that's also good to have a buddy with you for those moments. So write twice a day, meditate for real, do that, get a buddy and have somebody that you're talking to three times a week at least, that's good. So again, if you, ha if you need a way to find a buddy, come, come be a member, get into our community, come get on my free Zoom calls, daily practice calls. Everybody who signs up for the daily practice is invited to my free Zoom calls. There's like hundreds of people, a couple hundred people on those calls now every week. You're invited, come on over. And we, we write together, we meditate together, and then I take questions. And you can raise your hand and ask, ask a question about how to do it if you want. Um, they're wonderful. That's my, my favorite thing about doing Crappy Childhood Fairy is those calls. So the daily practice, for real, is how you're going to like lay the groundwork to be a person who doesn't get so filled with fear. The second thing I'm going to encourage you to do is to start to have ego deflation. <laughs> to allow that to happen around the idea you have that you have to succeed at this. I love making friends with the idea of failure. I love to embrace when I, and I get this probably best through the daily practice, but I, I, I get the fear out there. Fear, I'm really not cut out for this. Fear, I can't do it. If I were you, I'd probably be having fear. You know, fear, I can't be a professor because I cry so much. Maybe that might be true. So on the off chance that that really is the case, 
I think you can do a lot better by just embracing it. You don't have to like think only positively about this or convince yourself of anything. Just let it in, face the fear about it, ask for that fear to be removed and see what happens. Trust that as you get free of all your ideas, because you, know you know what your fears and resentments are, there's a whole lot of what's in there, is this idea that you have to do what people expect of you. That, um, or that you put all this time and money into a PhD program so it better become the career of your dreams. Like, just hold that lightly. It, it, it might be, there's, you know, the fact that you were drawn to go do it is, a, is an indication it really might be your calling. But we are not gonna be happy if we're not doing what we really feel called to do, what really gives us joy. So hold everything lightly, be flexible. I tell you, I've had five careers. The thing I got my master's degree in, I don't do it all. And I'm fine with that. And uh, a whole bunch of other jobs I had before I don't do anymore. And I like my job now. I like that I've been able to keep evolving and becoming who I really am. So it's better to fail at something that isn't right. And I'm not saying you're gonna fail or that it isn't right, but that's the fear, right? That's the fear, I'm no good, I can't really do this. It's like, okay, maybe you can't. Just be yourself, just be yourself. Be your authentic self. And I know this like, you know, defending your thesis, it's this very like formal process, very serious. The people involved are looking for specific things. Try to give it to them, but give it to them with a grain of salt in your spirit of just like, you know, I'm gonna do my best for what is expected of me in this ritual. <laughs> but I'm me, I'm the sovereign me, and I'm choosing my life. I'm gonna do what I wanna do. When you know that you're okay, whether you succeed or fail, then you're free to have no fear. That's what no fear is. And then you circle back to the daily practice because if something disappointing happens, if they say, I'm sorry, you just didn't make the grade and you're not, nope, sorry, you know, back to the drawing board for you. If that happens, you might be devastated, but you'll go right down, you'll just plunk down, you probably go sit in your car or on a train and take out your paper and pen and pour it out, pour it out here. You know, I fear I failed. When you know, you start to train your mind, like I've got my paper with me, I've got my pen, so don't you worry about what happens. We're gonna deal with it. We have somewhere for it to go. The fear level comes down. That compulsion to like be perfect just comes down. It doesn't matter because we know what we're gonna do with our fear and resentment. And we can trust that something good is coming of it. Less fear and resentment, less false pathways, fewer, fewer pathways that we chose to please other people or because you're supposed to, but, or, or that we thought were good, but we just found out we didn't like them. Less of that and more autonomy to just go, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do what, what feels right for me. I'm going to follow what I believe is my calling, and I'm totally willing to let go of things that turn out not to be it. It's a good attitude to have going into relationships too, I'll tell you what. So, so that's, that's what that fearlessness comes from, is the certainty that you're gonna be all right. And I would just say for myself, as a spiritual person, it helps a lot to have less fear. Um, my experience in becoming spiritual in, has been a lot to wake up to and realize that I'm not the accidental piece of crap that I used to think I was. I, I just used to have a lot of, I, I used to have a lot of feeling that I wasn't wanted as a kid and I wasn't really supposed to be here. And when things went wrong, I would just feel like I shouldn't even be on this earth. I'm not supposed to be here. All that was healed. All of that was healed. Of course I'm supposed to be here. I'm here. I knew with certainty that I belong here just as you do. You belong here and you, you, you come fully, fully endowed with gifts that you're, you will find a way to share your gifts and it will make you happy to do that. And all you have to do is, is, is get these obstacles out of the way of the fear of w what you're supposed to be and, and the resentment that you were so damaged as a kid that you can't do it. Like, we cannot labor under those beliefs. There's no time to labor under, under any kind of like indulgent belief that we're so broken that everything's hopeless. That's never true. It's never true. I, I, I know of people who are extremely broken and there are going to be limits on them. But look, you're writing a letter, you're watching videos on YouTube. You got, you got a lot going for you right now. And so just know that, know your freedom, be sovereign to yourself. And uh, you know, <laughs> if, they, if they don't like your work, then uh, you know, F them if they can't take a joke. <laughs> don't worry about it too much. And I hate it when people say that to me, don't worry about it too much. They have no idea the worries that I have sometimes. But this one is, 
this, there's nothing that could be worse than like committing to a life, to an academic life where people are hazing you all the time, where you feel like crying all the time, like, come on, you don't want that. So just give freedom a try, give lightheartedness a try. All right, so that's for you, Cindy. I can't wait to hear how this goes. Let me know how it goes. It's already working for you, I can tell. You're gonna be fine, I th and I, I have a feeling you are gonna be a professor, and you're gonna be a good one, so. Because you're gonna be free. Imagine a prof I know professors who do this daily practice, and they're amazing, and their students occasionally get to know them well enough that they get shown, too, how to do it. All right, my second letter today is from Elena. And this one's also about fear. We're talking about crippling fear today. And she says, Anna, how do I help my seven-year-old daughter and four-year-old son navigate this extreme hot and cold treatment from their father? I found the strength to leave him a couple of years ago, but the kids are still subjected to this treatment during his parenting time with them. Hot and cold behavior. I have them in therapy, but it seems that the therapists are just doing classic therapy with them that doesn't work with this type of abuse, and I fear for my children's future. Plus, the courts don't acknowledge this kind of abuse, nor do the children's protective services because there are no laws against it. I am in constant, severe anxiety thinking about my children's future. Do you have any videos about this or any programs?" she asked. So Elena, I'm really glad you wrote. This is a complicated question and one I can't just like shoot from the hip here because you, because you haven't given me a super solid idea of um, what it is your husband's doing. What I do know what you're saying is like nobody but you recognizes it as a problem. I don't know what the kids say, they're four and seven, so uh, it's hard to say how they feel about it or whether they've whether they've become aware that there's anything unusual about his behavior. <laughs> but um, the thing that jumps out at me is that you say, I'm in constant severe anxiety thinking about my children's future. So that to me, there is your, there is your action item. I'm gonna tell you a lesson I learned some years ago when somebody close to me died and I found them. I did CPR. I wasn't sure they were dead. I called 911, of course, immediately. It took 20 minutes and the police were the first to arrive and they came in and they came up to me and I was hysterical. My kids were out in the car in car seats. They were three and six, I think, at the time. And so it was terrifying just to leave them out in a car where they could get out and walk into the street or somebody could take them. But there was a dead person in, in this, in this uh, apartment where my friend lived and I couldn't bring them in. and. So I was trying to save a life and protect my kids. I was so dysregulated, as you can imagine. I was like going a million miles an hour. And I was on the phone with 911. And the cop walked in and he was this huge man, very strong. I can't really remember his face or his name, but I sure remember his presence and how relieved I was. And he walked in and I just said, is he dead? And he said, yeah. And it was like obvious to him. And when I saw, looked over and saw, I was like, oh yeah, it's obvious, like for 20 minutes. It hadn't been obvious to me. I was so dysregulated. And, you know, we had to discuss what had happened and what I found and what I knew about this. And then I was free to go. My kids were out in the car and I had asked as soon as they got there, could somebody please watch my kids? I can't bring them in here. And so, so there was another cop out there sitting with my kids. And I went out there and this cop, oh, God bless him. He took me by the shoulders. <laughs> And I have to think, you know, surely they had to ask themselves when they walked in whether I was the person responsible for this person's death. And somehow, you know, I was too dysregulated to really track this, but I guess because of the 911 call or the conversation, they knew that I was okay. But he took me by the shoulders, you know, just held me by my shoulders right there. And he was, there was something magical about his hands where he just sort of like connected me to the ground and he said, ma'am, and normally I hate being called ma'am. <laughs> he said, ma'am, your kids are out in that car and you're about to go show them how you feel about this. I don't know if you're gonna tell them today or tell them another time that this person in their life has died, but how they feel about it is going to be dictated, ma'am, by how you feel about it. And so Elena, that's what I wanna say to you. How your kids feel about their dad and cope with their dad is going to be primarily dictated by how you feel about it. So if you are 
struggling with constant severe anxiety thinking about their future, they are going to have constant anxiety thinking about their future. You're going to broadcast that. On the other hand, if you can develop confidence and honesty with yourself. I think something very helpful when you're a, a parent who has gone through a terrible divorce, because I was that person, a really important thing to do is to accelerate the process of facing whatever it is that you're doing that's creating hardship in the situation and deal with that. Like it's a super high priority, higher than other things, because when we're single parents and we're going, you know, we're still in the after effects of the divorce, there's a lot of fear, there's a lot of anger, and it comes out and the kids feel it. And that hurts them as much as, if not more than, the other parent being hot and cold with them. Now, again, I don't know exactly what is happening, but uh, I, I believe you that it's not great. But it's possible to have a parent who's not great, who does have partial custody, and to be the other parent and to say, how did it go with your dad today? And you know the old rule, you cannot throw that other parent under the bus. You don't want to cultivate bad feelings. For, for kids who are four and seven, they cannot hear bad stuff about their dad without feeling bad about themselves. That's kind of how it works. So your job is to, is to show them your confidence um, to show them that you're a listening ear, that you're a supportive person they can talk to about anything that didn't feel good and you can have conversations. How was that today? Did you have a good time? Did you feel good the whole time? Um, you know, I heard you two had an argument and what happened there and are you okay? And show them love and show them respect and show them the listening that you prize, that you feel they deserve from both parents. You give it to them. Don't throw the other parent under the bus. And whatever you do, don't leak your anxiety to them all over it. You got to show them, we've got this. That's what I did with my kids. After this person had died, I came to them and sat them down and I told them what had happened. And the first thing I said is, don't worry, I'm not going to die. This isn't going to happen to me because blah, 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 blah. It was a person who died from drugs. And I said, I don't do drugs. So I'm not going to die and you don't have to worry. And I told them, this is very sad. And I'm really sad today. And that means that I keep crying. And I, I didn't want to cry in front of you, but I can't help it. I'm so sad. But I promise you, we're going to be OK. These things happen sometimes, and they pass. And that's what you do. you, you got to be honest with the kids and not tell them things that are upsetting to them. Not lie. I didn't lie, but I didn't, I didn't put a big burden on them that they were not emotionally equipped to handle. And so that's what I imagine for kids four and seven. I had, you know, my parents got divorced when I was seven. They fought the entire time since I was born, basically till I was about 14. My dad got diagnosed with Lou Gehrig's disease when I was 13. And then he started getting along with my mom. And, and it was wonderful. It was so great when they got along. It's terrible when parents don't get along. So and I have a lot of experience with this. I actually created a course that I may offer through Crappy Childhood Fairy called Positive Shared Custody that I made with my kid's dad. Um, it's all done. It's sitting there, but it's a little bit off-brand for Crappy Childhood Fairy. But I've given a lot of thought about how to get along with your ex-partner when you're co-parenting, whether they are working with you on having a good dynamic or not. So. I really wish you well with this. It's so important what you're doing to be the loving, stable parent that they need right now. The whole crappy childhood fairy, we are the community. We're behind you all the way. We're behind you all the way, Elena. All right. So with that, I send my love. So thank you, Elena. Now, if you're watching this and you're like, do I have CPTSD? I have a list of 20 symptoms. I call it the self-assessment quiz for CPTSD. And I've put it right in the description section, top line, just below this video. And there's a link there. You can click on that and sign up and I will send you that list of 20, 20 common symptoms of CPTSD. See what you think. If you're not subscribed yet, of course I want you to subscribe. That would really help me. And you would get a notification every time I make a new video. Are you into this topic about fear? I think it's the most important thing there is as a premise for healing from CPTSD. So I've lined up this video right here that I'm going to recommend to you if you want to check that out. This video up here, that's what YouTube thinks is the best one for you based on their algorithm. Kind of interesting. You can see which one fits you best. Let me know in the comments and I will see you very soon.